Uh, welcome back. It's still Ballots 2023 coming to you from PLOS TV Africa as we take a look at another uh, dimension to all of that. Specifically, we'll be looking at the economic impact of the election and, of course, how it has impacted on the nation's GDP uh, before, uh, now that the elections are on, and, of course, the post-elections. Uh, I have uh, an economist uh, in the studio here with me, uh, Mokhtar Mohamed. Many thanks for joining us. A pleasure, thank you. It is indeed a pleasure. We also have um, Abraham Great uh, joining us on uh, via Zoom. Thanks for staying with us, Abraham. Hi, good evening to you and happy election day. Yeah, I, same to you. I guess I can actually state that. All right, uh, Mukta, let's start with you from uh, here in the studios. Let's talk about the economic impact of all of this, specifically uh, uh, from 2022 when the uh, federal government through the Central Bank of Nigeria began a whole lot of uh, economic um, policy and reforms as it were with the cash light policy how far would you say that's actually impacted on the election so far well if you look at um, reports we've been getting um, then what the security agencies have been able to do you could see the reason behind it which um, sometimes your program i say it was more political than economic mm. uh, we are seeing that because uh, we're beginning to see um, a lot of um, people are not coming coming out. Some of them mm. attribute their non-communal because of cash. Uh, <laughs> not giving giving to them, especially in some part of Nigeria. Um, had issues where we've seen some uh, people talk, politicians talk to some people and tell them that we don't have cash, we'll transfer to you. Mm. And they get upset and say, we don't trust you people. So uh, definitely, I think it has an impact on the election. Mm. The unfortunate thing is that um, the impact also dealt with the ordinary Nigerian before the election. So that also has not um, done well for the economy. Mm. But outside of that, I think it's, as we've seen, this is the first election we've seen uh, in terms of vote buying. I think it has been minimal. We can't say we've been able to eliminate it okay. in entirety, but I think it has been minimal. We've not had so much talks of where you see them staying in the, in the, in the pol polling unit, calling people, giving them cash to go. I think we've been able to reduce that to the barest minimum, especially so what the politicians is up to us giving uh, household items, foods, and uh, which they say this was palliative because of the suffering <laughs> that they are, are suffering from uh, because as a Nara result crunch. of the cashless policy, mm. Nara crunch. And uh, unfortunately, our governors that are doing that, and we're opening doing it, and so security agency couldn't arrest them. All right, uh, we'll take the conversation to Zoom uh, also. Uh, Abraham, let's get your candid opinion concerning all of that vis-a-vis uh, -vis all that uh, transpired uh, economically with the Naira crunch and, of course, uh, the cashless policy just before we headed to the polls today. How far would you say that has impacted uh, voters? Would you say it has been positively or negatively? It is, it is quite clear that um, the, the, the policy in itself had um, caused some political interference uh, in the country because when you look at uh, the CBN's uh, governor and his relationship within the party that he belongs to, uh, knowing that the office of the CBN is uh, sovereign, uh, have its own sovereignty, in, in, but uh, though limited to its independence, so it's, it's, it's unclear to me to really be sure what the motives um, uh, for the, the cashless policy, particularly the introduction of the new Naira note, albeit it's a fantastic policy, it seems, but it will come across that there are some ambiguity, which probably we will know later around um, that policy. First of all, because of the political interference that we see in the fact that the CBN governor Add interest. Secondly, there are—I mean, there should be a cohesive relationship between um, the CBN governor and the executive, not to the extent of involvement in uh, election uh, electioneering. So, when we come to a point in a uh, democracy, in a republic that we have, few weeks to the election or few months to the election, that the CBN governor is having, uh, you know cogent meetings with members of the executive in making policies to determine, you know, how the election is run, I have a problem that, you know, with that approach in itself. But you look at the strength of the policy, that this is meant to increase the financial stability in the country. So at this moment, I, I, it, it remains to be seen, and we will see what happens after the election results are announced, uh, if there's any 
uh, if they're going to revive the, the policy or go back to the Supreme Court um, judgment. Thank you. All right, we'll come back to you, Abraham. Now, Mukta, let's talk about uh, the GDP of the nation. Uh, by next month, uh, we'll be talking about at uh, the end of the first quarter. Uh, looking about the, about looking um, on the impact uh, this um, Naira crunch has had on banks specifically, we hear reports uh, of um, banks uh, being attacked. They were burnt, and the ATM terminals were burnt. How much of, it, of the impact will you say will be on the toll of the banks vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, the first quarter of uh, uh, 2023 GDP? Well, um, when you look at that, you need to look at um, how rampant was the attack. I think mm. um, even if those attacks happened, you realize that it was not at um, national spread, maybe two or three banks within um, some states. I think mostly Ogun states. I think that's where we have the major incident. Uh, it, for me, it's not so much that um, um, affected the bank in terms when we look at the effect on the bank mm. in terms of the contribution to the GDP we, 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 we look at um, uh, maybe the times that people were, were not able to get cash mm -hmm. uh, what it would do to the bottom line mm. of some of these banks the when sheets. maybe when their qu first quarter result is being uh, released mm. but fortunately for them the policy has been good for the bank in terms of their uh, income level because when you do this transfer um, it reduces, um, they make more profit even if it is mm. from the comfort of your, of your house. So they may not have so much impact in the bottom line of the bank. The only impact it has is that a lot of people were not able to withdraw their cash. Mm. A lot of people were not able to go out to do um, transactions, especially in the informal well, sector. That, that, that in itself, don't you think it would actually impact on the financial services sector? Because most people could not really access the bank. It will. Transactions were not. Transactions were not. So mm. it will have impact on the financial sector, mm. especially the informal sector. Okay. But for the formal sector, like I said, we've already they've already mm. gotten used with the cashless policy. They have impact in the informal sector, and, and, and that will, will reduce the type of patronage in terms of transaction they have with the bank, knowing that most people in the informal sector, some of them did not even have an account. Mm. But some of them, again, the positive is that some of them had to start having accounts. Okay. They had to have accounts, and sometimes... Even, uh, even the, the trader close to you begin to tell you, okay, can you transfer it to my account? Mm -hmm. The FinTech guys came to their aid also by giving them some app, even if we have some security challenges with some of those app. So definitely it has its negativity, and that negativity has to do with um, uh, the informal sector. Mm -hmm. And the informal sector is the key driver of, of the economy. Nigeria economy. So mm -hmm. definitely when you look at that from that area of the informal sector, it will have a negative impact on the GDP. When you look at it uh, uh, in the short term, the impact it has had in the banking sector, especially in the area of transaction, mm -hmm. it has also not gone well for them. Right. But in terms of uh, 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 patronage, in terms of patronage, if you look at what we got from the Nigerian interbank settlement, uh, we got a patronage that's gone up to about 70 something percent in terms of, the, of using a cashless policy. Mm -hmm. And when you compare some, some something percent, to what we add up to the bank bottom lines. Definitely, the bank still had um, some good transaction in terms of the bottom line. But in terms of relationship, mm -hmm. in terms of um, affecting the, the informal sector, yeah. it, it, it's, it's, it's going to tell on our, on our GDP. All right, Mukta, we'll come back and talk more concerning the, this impact of um, the cashless policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis lots of people now operating uh, uh, using PSPs uh, for transactions and all of that. Uh, we. Uh, we saw and uh, we uh, hear reports of our failed transactions. We'll talk about um, how it has impacted on uh, the banks and, of course, um, their technology um, deployment and all of that. But let me uh, still bring uh, Abraham to this. Let's talk about INEX um, spending so far and um, what uh, they uh, budgeted for this year. If I could just get the graphics uh, on, on air right now uh, for 2019 and, of course, um, 2023. Because uh, so far, what we hear, the INEC budgeted about 355 billion naira for the 2023 elections as against what was budgeted for the past um, election. A whole lot of Nigerians uh, are reacting concerning that. And uh, a school of thought believes that uh, we're actually spending so much uh, for our elections. Uh, do you really think uh, any amount could be too much to, uh, to change uh, the baton of um, one leadership to the other? Uh, Abraham. Well, first, I want to commend my colleague in the studio on um, his response to uh, the cashless policy. He was, you know, spot on on exactly the impact of that. Um, but I would like to add that um, as Nigerians, we complain about everything. 
But you have to look at the INEC budget in terms of global standard. Mm. And from 2014, as, uh, as a country, we have been moving from, you know, most of our voting that are just ballot boxes alone into electronic transmissions and electronic voting, um, you know, uh, cloud saving and stuff like that. These things run on huge budgets nationally. But because we, we, we as a people have been complaining since the 1920s, there is nearly nothing that we see good in our government in most cases. So every time, and we want to understand this, either it is in America, it's in the UK, in France, or in Nigeria, uh, you know, public procurement is always very ambiguous and the number are always staggering. So I, I, I wouldn't be able to poke the nose because I don't have the detail of what the expenditure on the list of the items uh, or the items on the list of the budget is, but it would not be too far away. Check how much they spend on American election, a country that is already civilized, that has system, that have electricity, that all of that. Look at how much they spend in other countries that practices the kind of democracy as we practice. I'll have a say in that. We know that every uh, public procurement, as I believe one of the biggest problems we still have in the country, is all the loopholes in the, uh, in, 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 the, in the Procurement Act in the country. So there is always room for people to maneuver their way in procurement, but we don't need to necessarily begin to criticize uh, INEC. I believe that our INEC, our electionary system, need more funding. So you get to a point where people can vote from their phone, vote more easily so that we can reduce chaos outside. All right, uh, Mokhtar, let's get your reaction concerning um, INEC's um, budget. Uh, about um, over 350 billion now was budgeted this year for the polls. Like you said, um, when you look at that again, we, we are not looking at the exchange rates mm. as far as 20, the last time we had election, 2019, 2019 yeah. and today. At that time, the exchange was about 350, mm. 60. And it's gone over it's way, nice. way official. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking even official and parallel was 350. Okay. So now, even official, we are doing about 450, mm. about 450, 450, 460. So when you look at that, by and by how, and, and knowing that they were using a lot of technology, they would do a lot of purchasing. When you look at the inflation figures also have gone high. The things that you bought in 2019, today is over 10 to 15% hike in those prices. Sometimes get as high as 70%. So definitely, I, 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 I don't think what they've spent is so much. Uh, people even think that um, um, they've not spent so much if, 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 if uh, much was given to them, especially in, in other areas that we, we, INEC was also complaining to the National Assembly about. So I don't think there's a challenge with what they, 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 they've given to them by and by the kind of result we expect from them. So we start challenging those things when we are, when we are not seeing those results commensurable with the amount of money they collected. All right, uh, Mokta, I still want us to talk about uh, payment service providers uh, because uh, in the past uh, few days and... Uh, a week or so, Nigerians have been uh, moving towards that particular line since uh, most banks' apps and um, transfers were really failing. Sometimes you do transfers and you don't even get value uh, until after 48 hours. hours. Would you really say this cashless policy has exposed them um, how much of um, technology that we have not fully embraced uh, in the financial services sector? You, see, you hit the nail on the nose. I think we've not done that, and I think the banks too did not expect it, and the CBN did not carry them along, as far as I'm concerned, because um, we, we know the challenges of even having like um, about the former sector where you have about maybe 20 to 30 million Nigerians doing transactions. The bank were having challenges with that. And you are now saying almost everybody will go cashless. We have about 80% of Nigerians going cashless. So you're talking about 100 and something million people at a time wanting to do transactions. The, the, the infrastructure is not, it won't be enough to carry that. And again, you remember, you know that the banks also are not doing what is done in developed countries, which are shared infrastructure whereby they have a big network whereby all banks come together and build a system whereby each bank can share from it. But what we have here is each bank has to build their own infrastructure. So what I expected the CBN to do was to, call, uh, to, to, to bring the bank together, be the leader, try to say, okay, how can we do some uh, in, investment in share infrastructure so that we have this cashless policy, have a sleepless flow. Mm. It definitely is the way to go. But in our own system, because of the challenges that we have to go, 
And because the banks are not prepared for the volume of transaction, mm -hmm. you have to see those down times whereby some transaction refuse to go. People have to wait till late in the night to do some transaction. So definitely, it has to do with the infrastructure. They need to improve the infrastructure. And when you talk about improvement infrastructure, it also comes with expenditure. It also comes with funding. And then it also comes with the cost on the customers too, mm -hmm. because banks are going to invest in those infrastructure. So you can't be seeing charges at 15 naira again. If you want to invest in those infrastructure, then you need to, they, there will be charges that will come with it. And sometime again, the CBN or the, 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 the telecom sectors are not on the same wavelength with the customers and with the bank. Let me give you an example. The, the best performing cashless policy we have in Africa is in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And where it's been driven largely by the telecom sector, Safaricom, even the rural people, they're using code and it's working very well because there was a partnership between the telecom sector and the mm -hmm. banks services. and also the, 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 their, their own CBN. So mm -hmm. definitely, uh, we need to look at share infrastructure one, then also we begin to look at how we can build a robust financial institution. Not only that, then there should be penalties. Mm. If I am doing a transaction because a real transaction is not going, the CBA has a rule that every, every complaint should be resolved within 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Or you go to banks and you, you, they tell you that it's six working days and no bank has been sanctioned about that. So definitely it's a big challenge. You need to begin to tell banks. In developed economy, when you go and you say, look, I did a transaction, it has not um, um, f f uh, f come true. They look at it and even they said, okay, well, you know what, we'll do it again for you, let it go, then we'll investigate it. And when they see that, okay, it will, they will retrieve it. Mm. So, but that also comes with its own because everybody is, is, knows where everybody is in terms of data, yeah. you know where they work, you know their financial status. But in Nigeria also, that would be a challenge because mm. somebody can be in Lagos today, tomorrow he has moved to Ibado, nobody even knows his address. So, uh, but with the BBN, we could also uh, be able to track that. But I think more we should look at doing shared infrastructure. Okay, let me bring uh, Abraham again. I just want to find out uh, uh, how it's been able to work in developed countries. Uh, you are in Canada and bulk of transactions are done uh, through wire transfer and of course uh, through PSPs and all of that. Uh, uh, Mukhtar here talked about um, shared, info, uh, shared uh, infrastructure on the part of um, the telecoms companies and, of course, um, the banks. Uh, how would you say it has been able to work out so well in Canada? What advice can you give? Well, um, I have lived less than a year in Canada. I've lived uh, over 20 years in the UK. But anywhere in the world, cashless you know, policy is a very great one. But there are gray areas uh, as it regards to Nigeria, how the policy is being implemented. So you will see the world has already gone cashless many years ago. I mean, I learned that from Richard Branson, that even in the countries where I live, I, I rarely uh, touch the notes. And same thing when I'm in Nigeria, I just don't like the physical uh, uh, note. But in terms of the, its implementation in Nigeria, it's still very difficult because we are still not viable in terms of no technology, I am saying that we have the human capital. The human capital resources are there in that we are very intelligent. Uh, aside from India and China, Nigerians are one of the best techie nation in the world. But between the knowledge pool that we have and implementation, we have a very big gap. And a big example is the e -Naira. If I can digress a little bit into that. The INRA policy, when it was made, for example, and it was assigned to a foreign company to develop the app that will you know, convey that policy, I think that was a little bit poor on the part of Nigeria, uh, on the part of the CBN. I think it is session, uh, session 39 of, uh, of the CBN Act that deals in terms of supervision. Session 40 deals in terms of the inspection. You talk about when the policy has been made, I, have we really seen a relationship between CBN and the banks in terms of supervising the technological transformation in, 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 in management? We call it project uh, uh, change management. And you have to manage the process. You have to manage the implementation of policy. And sometimes you actually give gaps of years for test run. And we have the opportunity because of the economy of scale, our, 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 our population to not only follow what the world is doing, but to actually take the lead because the human resources are there. 
the finances are there for us to, to do so. But in terms of the policy, like I said, with the power of the bank, the, you know, the sections of the uh, um, uh, CBN Act, its implementation vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with the banks, there is a huge gap. We are operating in a kind of a system in Nigeria at the moment where CBN is almost operating like a dictator. So you see CBN focuses on Session 40. I think it's Session 43 for sanction. They just pick banks, they pick financial services and sanction them. But when it comes to their role in Session 39 and 40 implementation, uh, 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 supervision, uh, sanction, they are not very good. So that is, I mean, that's a gap. That's an area that the CBN can actually work on to run fast on the deployment of technology for the advantage of the citizens. Hello, hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.